The Wild and Exotic Adventures of a Wasp. We're back here with Don Anderson. I'm son Steve. We're going to talk about uh, presidents. So uh, you've had some uh, exotic adventures with presidents. Uh, the first one's maybe with uh, Tricky Dick. Tricky Dick Nixon. Yep. Yeah. Well, during my life, for some odd reason, I've had direct contact with uh, a couple of presidents and some great stories about friends of mine who had direct contact with presidents. I think it's kind of funny. First one is about Nixon. Uh, I worked for Gannett, and my job, I was a personnel guy there, and I had a, one of my responsibilities was security. So uh, one day, I went to the office. My secretary says, there's a couple of people here to see you from the FBI. Uh, so they came in. It turns out they were not FBI. They were Secret Service. So I said, yeah, what can I do? He said, well, Nixon's coming to town here next week. And he's going to come to the Cadet newspaper building and talk to the editorial staff. And then... Uh, he was running, to, running for office? He was a sitting president then. Okay. And um, so they said, he's going to come here, and then going back to the airport, he's going to take, take a helicopter out to Paul Miller's house. Paul Miller was the publisher and president of the Gannett newspaper chain. So I said, okay, what can I do for you? He said, well, two things. One thing is there are along the route from here to the airport a lot of what we call honor boxes, where you put a quarter in in those days, and you... The thing opens, you take a newspaper out. Mm -hmm. They said you have to, have to take all those off, out of the way because they are a great place to plant bombs. So we can't have any of those along the route. And I said, okay, I guess I can arrange that. And they said the th second thing you have to do is provide us access to the roof of this building because we will have some snipers up there. Just mm -hmm. in case there's any problem, we will have snipers. Yep. Yeah. So I said, okay, we can do that. So the day comes, we get rid of the honor boxes. The snipers arrive in full SWAT gear. They go up to the roof. Uh, Nixon comes to town in a cavalcade and goes to the building, has his uh, conference with the editors of Gannett, and then leaves. And then uh, after that, there's a big reception out at Paul Miller's house, which is out in the suburbs of Rochester. He was the, the editor of... Oh, yeah. He was, a, back then, the president of Gidette. President of Big Mucky Muck. Big Mucky Muck. Did you have... Did he know who you were, or you were sort of an underling, or... Well, I was a bit of an underling, but I did get invited to the reception at Miller's house. Okay. So you were there. So I was there. So I'm standing at the bar, having a drink, when this helicopter lands... Lands out in the front lawn, and everybody gathers around, the state troopers gather around, and Nixon gets off the plane, shakes hand here, shakes hands here, shakes, works his way up to the house, shaking hands with everybody. Finally, I'm standing at the bar. He finally gets up to the bartender, and he says, do you know what I'm supposed to do next? <laughs> he said that to you or to the no, bartender? the bartender. Yeah. The bartender says, I don't know what the hell you're supposed to do here. So finally somebody comes along and says, you're supposed to be over here and make this speech, whatever. But I thought that was so funny. I mean, the vulner vulnerability of a, the a president. president. Yeah. He didn't, did he, you don't recall that he ordered a drink? No, I don't think so. He just wanted to figure out what the hell he was where, here Where for. do I go now, sort of? Well, then another story about Clinton. Uh, this is not one that I was personally, but a good friend of mine, uh, Harold Johnson, uh, had retired and was working at Chautauqua as a uh, marshal on the golf course. So Clinton came to Chautauqua. I think this was when he was preparing for one of the presidential debates, and he came there uh, to prepare for it. And while he was there, uh, they got a call at the golf course that Clinton wants to play golf tomorrow. They said, okay, we'll do that. And he says, he's going to need 37 golf carts. And they said, 37 golf carts? Yep. He's got to have uh, two golf carts for he. And uh, I think the local congressman was going to play with him then. And Panetta was his uh, something. Leon and, Panetta. Leon Panetta. Yeah. 
So they arranged that, and then there were like 10 golf carts for Secret Service people, and then a first aid team, and then reporters and whatever, 36 or 37 golf carts. carts. So they, they figured that, all that out. But the funny thing about this was they said that that entourage had to stop six times in the 18 holes for Clinton to go off into the woods to relieve himself. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, this guy's got some problems. You know, maybe this is going to be a big story. He's got some kind of problem, but it never worked out that way. But so he was going to, the. let me just stop for a second just so people understand. The word that Harold got was six times, every three holes. Right. Clinton was going to have to stop. Yeah. Go off into the woods. If there wasn't a, a you know. A if cop, there wasn't a. He go into the woods to, to do it. All right, so. But you thought that might be a big story, but turned out not turned to out be. not to be. But I always thought, you know, here's this high mucky muck out there. But every ten, twelve minutes, he's what going do we in. think he was doing out there? Do we think he just actually had to go take a pee, or that was I think he just had to go in take case. a pee. I thought the guy had some kind of prostate problem or, yes. or something like that. Yeah, and thought maybe the news would get wind of that. Yes, so. I thought that you know, but you thought maybe you could have turned. You were not a Clinton fan, were you? I was not a Clinton fan at all, and I'm still not a Clinton fan. Well, all right. Well, Be Hillary Clinton there. at the time at the time of this recording is is uh, hopefully going to right. be running. Right. But uh, you got a story about George Herbert Walker Bush, the first Bush. The first Bush. Okay, another funny story. We have friends who live in uh, Houston. They belong to a club called the Evergreen Club. Friends? Relatives. Relatives that live in Houston. Yeah, relatives. Jeff and Becky live in, Jeff and Be- live in live Houston. Houston. Yeah. And the Evergreen Club had a restricted membership. I think it was like 300 or 400 members. That's all it could be. Well, when George Bush lost the election to Clinton, would, I can't remember. I guess, yeah, he would have lost it to Clinton. Yeah. yeah. So they came. They moved back. Probably here. because of how well he prepared. That's right. At Chautauqua. That's right. Yeah. So they moved back to Houston, and the Evergreen Club amended their constitution to allow in two more members, like three hundred two or four hundred. George and Barbara. George and Barbara. And we had heard about this from my relatives. So one day we're down there, and they had great tennis courts there. So Jeff, our relative, said, "Look." Let's play tennis at noon. Uh, I have to go into work in the morning, but walk over there. It was only like three or four blocks from their house. Mm-hmm. And I'll meet you there at the noon. We'll play some tennis, have lunch. I said, that's great. So I got on my tennis togs, my shorts, and my tennis racket, and I walked over there at noon. And as I walked in, it was kind of deserted, but I walked. It was kind of a center court thing. I walked in there. There was nobody there but ex-president George Bush and uh, another red-haired guy who was, he was kind of talking to. So I was kind of taken back by the whole thing. I looked around, you know. So finally I stood over on the edge of, of the place and, kind of, and I had my tennis racket in my tennis bag. And I saw a guy get up from a table way over on the edge and walked over to the club manager. And finally the club manager came over to me and said, Sir, uh, could I ask you what you're doing here? And I said, well, I'm supposed to meet Jeff Parsons here to play uh, some tennis at noon. And he said, Jeff Parsons? I said, yes. Oh, yeah, I know Mr. Parsons. He said, would you mind waiting out in the lobby? (laughs) So I said, okay. So I went out there, and finally Jeff came, and I said, George Bush is in there having lunch, and they wouldn't let me stay there. And he said, well, you know, the Secret Service stuff. So finally, Jeff and I played lunch, or played tennis, and the wives, Jeff, or Pat, and Becky came. And we had lunch. We sat right next to George and his friend. So we went home that night, and Jeff had a bunch of kids. He had six kids then. And we said, guess what? We had lunch today with the ex-president, George Bush. And the kids said, yeah, we know him. His grandchildren go to our school. He comes all the time to our school and tells us what it was like to be president. (laughs) So that was our... They were not impressed. They were not impressed at all, the fact that we had sat next to George Bush. Were you at all inclined to 
go over. You must have voted for George Bush. Oh, I sure. But, you know, it was just a, one of those awkward situations where big-time celebrities sitting like six or seven feet from you. But but when you were playing uh, in the tennis courts, you weren't going to walk over and, no. and say no, no. anything. Plus, you know, as it turns out, he had all these Secret Service guys around him. If you had if approached been, them with a bag, you could have been taken down. <laughs> they probably wouldn't have taken me down. Maybe would have shot me. I don't know. Well, let's finish this up with we're right in the middle of presidential elections now. Um, we're in the primaries. You're a... At, at this time, anyways, an avowed Republican and have been for many years, although you voted for Kennedy, which maybe we'll talk about yep. on another podcast. Yeah. But we had the New York State primary yesterday. Who did you vote for? Well, it's an American's privilege not to tell who you voted for. But, but I, let's put it this way. I did not vote for uh, Trump. Yeah. And I did not vote for Cruz. Okay. So... Leave to your imagination. Why what do you vote? think of uh, the possibility of Trump being a president? I think this election is the weirdest one that we have faced in years. To think that this guy, Trump, that he could win the New York State primary is to me so uh, bizarre that I can't even I can't even imagine how it could have happened. Mm-hmm. Hillary. I mean, a, a retread well, Hillary. Comes well, back. we can, yeah, we, I, we will. I will go on record saying his Don's views on uh, Democrats are well known, and although he might admire a few people uh, off the record, he's not going to vote that way. But no, I tell you, I was a big Kennedy fan. When he, Kennedy came to Rochester, we went out to the airport, saw him get off the plane. He was like a god. He stepped off. He had this well-tanned, almost yellow kind of complexion. The crowd went absolutely bonkers. Mm-hmm. Then we raced downtown to the War Memorial, and when he walked in there, uh, the spotlight on, it was the like he was the ultimate rock star. But then I soon began to realize that my personal um, political point of view was more supported by the Republican side. And the guy who converted me was Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp. I heard him give a speech up at the uh, Adirondack Club, and I'll tell you, I said, that guy made more sense than I've heard in a long time. He went on to become senator, ran for president. Yeah, ex-quarterback for the Bills. Ex- but that was that speech that got me started on a lifelong uh, trip of being a Republican. Less government, uh, more individual responsibility, etc. All right, well, this has been a episode of The Wild and Political Adventures of a Wasp, starring Don Anderson. And uh, join us again soon. There will be more to come.